pike are always a, a fun thing to to chase in the winter. So like with that, Bethany, if you want to share your your PowerPoint and we can get started with the webinar. Does that look all right? Yep, it looks good. Okay. Well, thanks for having me here to talk about I am a fisheries research scientist and I'm stationed in Duluth. Um, and although my office is right on Lake Superior, I primarily um, study fish in our inland lakes, as we say. Um, one of the fish I have a keen interest in is northern pike, and I co lead. The Northern Pike technical team, um, which is a team of about 10 of us who um, meet to guide and inform DNR policy on things from regulations um, to the research that we need and stuff like that. So that's why I'm here today. Although I, I've been with the DNR for about 10 years, um, I pieced together this work that's the result of a lot of different people. Um, our fisheries management staff doing surveys and uh, leadership working on regulation proposals, and then also our engaged stakeholders who have vocalized both their criticism and their support to ensure that we'd have fishing opportunities for pike for the future. So I'm doing my best to tell a story that I'm um, a very small part of. Today, we'll just go over a little bit of pike and the regulation uh, history. Um, as well as talk about how we got to where we are now with um, our current zone system. And then we'll finish up by uh, talking about tip ups and um, how to catch pike through the ice that way. So, you might know, but uh, pike are a native species in Minnesota. They're usually a mid to top level predator. They eat fish primarily, but they also eat crayfish and a smattering of other things. They like uh, vegetation and they spawn on vegetation um, right at uh, ice out. So it's that's an important habitat component for them. And although it varies by lake and season, um, for a big fish, they're a relatively shallow habitat user, which makes them um, fun for someone like me who I don't target uh, any fish specifically, but I like to hang out around the weed line where you can catch you know, anything and usually a, a pike will pop out in that mix as they're pretty aggressive. Um, the stake record for pike was a 45 pound fish, which would equate to with our um, length weight equations about a 50 inch fish and that was caught in 1929. And then um, just a year ago on that same lake, actually, we set the or a angler set a catch and release record um, with a pike of 46 inches. So they can get pretty big. Um, on average, we'll see Pike that are more in the 20 to the 30 range, but there are those monsters out there. So for a long time, um, the regulation for northern pike was a, a limit of three, and you could just have one over 30 inches, one of those especially over 30 inches. Um, that's a statewide reg. It's in 1948, when Truman was president, the limit was set at three. And then in 1994, under the Clinton administration, uh, they added that one over 30 to protect some of those larger fish. And that's about as simple as it's you know been. Um, not real complicated for a very long time. Um, we do have special regulations, toolbox regulations, we call them, uh, and they were especially in the 90s and early 2000s starting to be applied more and more where an individual lake might have a different regulation to try and uh, grow bigger fish or protect fish. Um, but in uh, that sort of started to uh, creep up to a number that some stakeholders were uncomfortable with where we had a lot of lakes that had special regulations on them. And we were eventually uh, limited as the DNR to only having special regulations on for Northern Pike on 100 lakes. Um, and it's still like that today. But with that in mind, we sort of um, decided maybe we needed to shift from this individual lake management approach. So taking a broader look at how we manage pike to see if we could tailor our regulations um, better to populations. 
more broadly. So that's really the story I'm going to talk about today is how we went from this, you know, pretty simple one line in the reg book to now we have tables and maps and all kinds of stuff happening. So it can be a little intimidating if you just want to keep a pike and if you were to flip through and see if um, you could keep this one, suddenly you're inundated with all this information, um, including uh, some different seasonal components. So um, we're going to break it down today and hopefully it'll make sense as to why it uh, is the way it is. So it all starts with the Minnesota landscape. Um, and over time, people realize that we've got some geographical patterns to the way pike populations are um, across the state. We've got the central part of the state here, um, cabin country, I'm calling it, where we have a lot of populations with moderate and high densities. So on this map, the gray circles are lakes where our average net catches in our uh, lake surveys that the DNR does are low. We've got low catch rates, which, you know, so there's not very many pike in the lakes, probably. The yellow circles indicate getting to pretty moderate or higher levels. And then the green circles are populations where there's a lot, a lot of northern pike being caught in our nets, and there's probably a high abundance in the lake. So in the central part of the state, we've got a lot of those yellow and some green uh, mixed in with the gray, so more moderate to high densities of pike. And then in the arrowhead region, there's a lot more gray circles, um, although it's, you know, there's always a couple other colors mixed in there, but pretty low densities, low numbers. And then down in prairie or egg country, it's the same deal. First of all, you've got fewer lakes with northern pike, which is kind of interesting. And then just in general, the numbers um, tend to be lower. There's more of those gray circles, more low density lakes. So, it's important to think about the number of pike that might be in a lake because generally when you've got more pike, you've got smaller pike. They compete with one another for food, and so they just don't grow as big. Um, and then you start to get what we call those hammer handle lakes or um, lakes with snaky pike, or there's a lot of um, mean names for populations like that. People really uh, don't tend to enjoy that as much as when you can have higher quality pike populations with fewer fish and more large fish. Um, when you have a lot of pike like that, they do eat a lot of food. Um, we did a, uh, Tyler Aaron Stork, who's a researcher with the DNR, did a modeling study where he found that when you have populations dominated by younger, smaller northern pike, they eat more food actually than those with um, older fish in the population where there might be um, fewer pike overall. So uh, those young fish are trying to grow and they're eating a lot of perch and food that would be good um, for other fish like walleye um, and just putting a lot of pressure on the prey system. And we found also that walleye stocking uh, works better when you have lower numbers of pike. And so we have this plot here, which um, shows the walleye gillnet catch. Um, on the y-axis and the northern pike gillnet catch in our surveys on the x-axis. And what the lines here are trying to draw your attention to are that you only get these higher walleye catches when the northern pike um, catches are lower. And this was in lakes that were stocked with fingerlings. So our stocking is only going to work uh, when we have those, or is going to work best, not only work, but work best when if we can get our numbers of pike down. So for a a myriad of reasons, whether it's just wanting to catch quality fish or worried about other fish in the populations, it's better if you can get densities of pike down. There's also um, another kind of theory here behind this, which is that if you have large northern pike in the system, they can keep smaller pike in check. There is cannibalism in these populations, so big pike will eat small pike. Um, we as people probably, even if you harvest as much as you want, of you know 18 to 22 inch pike, smaller um, relative to the general population, we could probably never get as many pike out of that population as you would need to to reduce the competition. But having um, some large predators in there puts that constant pressure on, which could be good overall. And um, so by restoring large pike where they've been lost through harvest or whatever, um, we can maybe make a little bit of a dent in that small pike um, abundance. 
is the idea. But there's another kind of wrench in all of this. Um, in the 90s, uh, Rod Pierce, who was a longtime Northern Pike researcher for the DNR, he actually wrote a book about Northern Pike management. He took a look at um, lakes that had special length regulations for Northern Pike, and there were some fish that had tags. So if an angler caught the tag, they could report it. Um, or if uh, if they ran into a creel clerk at the axis, you know, they might see this tag. And what they found was that um, a lot of <clears throat> the fish harvested reported either through tags or to the creel clerks were fish that were in that uh, the slot uh, length limit where you weren't supposed to harvest harvest fish. In fact, as many as 50 to 80% of the fish coming back were um, illegally harvested. Now, because these are people who are reporting what they've caught, chances are they're not trying to be sneaky and get away with something. It's probably that they didn't know about the regulation, didn't see the sign at the access or whatever. Um, and so not having knowledge of regulations designed to protect uh, you know, medium-sized pike to get them bigger or whatever we're trying to do can put a real dent in the effectiveness of regulations. So um, that we have understood to be a component all along. Hey, Destiny, yeah. can I jump in real quick? We yeah. just had a question from Adam that came in, wondering if he get more information on the book you just referenced that was written. Could you oh, repeat yeah. the name of that? Yeah, so it's um, Rod Pierce is the author. And it's, I believe, called Northern Pike Ecology and Management History, maybe. Um, and it was published around 2012 or something like that. It's okay, available in libraries. Will, yeah. <laughs> we'll look it up and see if we can find a link for it. Thank you. Yep. It's a good read. Um, it's pretty conversational um, and, and also informative. Lots of neat history. So. Um, yeah, didn't mean to be a plug in a book here, but there we go. So, speaking of kind of the geography of the state, I thought we could just break it down in terms of what we see and then what we decided to do when we went with zonal regulations. So, as I mentioned before, in the southern part of the state, which I've got um, circled here with that oval, uh, we've got lower abundance and these fish are in more productive lakes, so they tend to have faster growth but then a shorter lifespan overall. So there's fewer fish, less competition, more nutrients in the lake, so maybe more prey. And so you can have a potential to get some bigger fish pretty fast, um, but just because of conditions, they might not live as long, whether that's winter kill or whatever. So you want to um, take advantage of the growth that growth potential they do have. Um, so our objectives here were to increase the catch of larger fish, um, but to protect young fish. So if you have a, a limit of three and a one over 30 regulation for the Southern zone, which was the statewide reg, that's not um, protecting young fish at all, really. Um, since you could have, you know, three uh, age one or two fish that might be big enough to harvest, but you want to give them a chance to reproduce before you harvest them. So. And the idea there was give a little more protection to those young fish, especially considering we have maybe less reproduction, lower densities, but still allow for some harvest. So the regulation there now is a limit of two with a 24 inch minimum size. Theory being okay, with 24 inches, they've had a chance to reproduce and um, they're ready to be taken if uh, angler wants. The Northeast zone, um, this area, again, has lower abundance overall, but contrary to the southern zone, you've got slow growth to a larger maximum size. These lakes are a lot less productive, um, and so reproduction might be low, and then growth is also pretty slow. And it might take a long time for a fish to get to a big size, um, and there might not be very many of them, so we want to protect what's there that could be depleted pretty easily. Our objective here was to maintain some harvest opportunity. Um, Pike are an important sport fish up there. Some of the fish communities have fewer species. And so um, being able to fish for pike is probably pretty important and to keep some. And yet we do wanna protect those large trophy fish so we don't lose the quality that exists there. So the idea here was to have a reduced um, bag limit. So you can keep two Northern pike up there now, 
and there's no harvest between 30 to 40 inches, but you can keep, you know, if you get that one that you want on the wall, uh, one fish over 40 inches. So the idea there is that the fish are able to make it to 30 inches. We're going to grow them up um, to be uh, really big, hopefully. Um, here is where we start to see that there's a different regulation for dark house spears in the winter where they have the same bag limit, but their um, size limit is different. They can have one fish over 26 inches. And um, we'll talk about that more later, but that comes into our um, just different user groups and needs that we're balancing with our management. In the North Central Zone, which is our more complicated uh, area where we've got these a lot of high abundance population and populations in many lakes that have just are dominated by smaller, medium sized fish. Um, we'd really like to uh, increase the number of large fish, hoping to rebalance the populations um, and also provide a more quality harvest opportunity. But here again, we want to make sure um, people can take advantage of what's there. There's really no reason um, not to take small fish if you um, want to, because there's plenty of them. So we increased the bag limit to 10, um, which is quite a big jump, but we're protecting fish now that are from 22 to 26 inches. Those are not allowed to be harvested. And then you can have two fish over 26 inches now instead of one over 30. The idea being, if we protect some of those medium sized pike, we can spit more out the end of the uh, top end of the slot there and provide some more opportunity for harvest of quality fish. Um, meanwhile, uh, you know, if you want to pickle, Pike, you can uh, do that to your heart's content, really, because there's plenty out there in a lot of lakes. Here again, we have a different regulation for the spearers. Um, this regulation is a little bit more complicated where a spearer is allowed to have one fish within that 22 to 20 inch length slot um, and one over 26 inches, or they can have two over 26 inches. Um, this is a, something that's complicated and I think often misunderstood. The idea is not to um, have spears or targeting fish in that protected slot. However, what it is is it can be hard to judge um, with that kind of accuracy whether a fish is you know 21 or 22 or 26 or 27. Um, so the idea is if you if a spear accidentally um, misjudges a length there, you know they're not um, going to get in trouble. They're still allowed to keep spearing that kind of thing. So it's more of a an allowance rather than supposed to be a target for fish in there, because we still would like to protect and grow fish of that size. But again, just trying to balance the different um, needs and nuances to our user groups. Uh, another thing is, you know, where are you going to put the zone lines? Um, the lakes aren't following the highways, really, uh, but that's what we use to draw our lines for our zones, just because it's something that everyone can find. You can look at a map or look on your phone and see what side of Highway 53 or Highway 7 am I on. Um, the population types don't fall perfectly across those highways. And as you saw, there's you know mixed lakes even deep within the zones um, that don't really match the pattern we're trying to um, manage for. But uh, Theory is this is still better than just having one statewide regulation because at least you're tailoring the regulation a little bit better to the type of lake that's predominant in an area. Um, I will say there are some complications for enforcement when you have zones like this, because in theory, um, you could go out in the southern zone in the morning and harvest a 24 inch fish perfectly legally, go home, go back out to a lake in the north central zone um, and harvest nine 20 inch fish and you know you would be within your um, legal harvest. When it comes to that kind of thing, um, your best bet is to check the possession section of the regulations book or our website or even talk to a CEO or the local area office. Um, you know generally the rules there are labeling fish, keeping them intact and transport and stuff like that. So um, if you're someone who's along one of those zone boundary lines, um, there's, it's a little bit complicated, um, what's allowed and what's not, and just something to be aware of. 
Hey, Bethany, um, yeah. we had a good question from John about transportation directly related to what you were just talking about. Can you say a little bit more about the requirements? And there's some question, I guess, about whether or not you have to have head and tail intact because some of the regulations say do not list Northern Pike in that. But is this considered a special regulation um, that you do have to have the pike intact? Yeah, I'm not definitely not an expert on this enforcement piece. It's definitely something our technical team has um, talked about back and forth, and we are trying to keep it straight. Um, I feel um, that the best case, especially if you're near a zone boundary, is definitely just keep the fish head and tail intact, um, like it says in the book for other things, and I've even fins. Um, you know, especially if you're going to have uh, you know, fish from different zones um, in your in your possession. I, I think the best thing is just to protect yourself and keep it straight. Yeah, I think that's a good suggestion. Whenever there's a question, if you know there's some policy or regulations that are in place to make this more clear, you know, be take take the cautious approach, the step that will make it really clear so you do not get in trouble, right? Yeah. Thank you. So dark house spearing is a really neat and unique um, sport that we have in Minnesota. I actually learned this winter that it's not allowed uh, for pike in Wisconsin. So it's, it is a unique opportunity and it's something that the DNR is not in the business of um, trying to limit. However, whenever you start putting length limits um, on pike, that's, you know, getting the spears in danger of limiting their opportunity um, to participate in their sports, since there is no spear measure and release, unfortunately. Um, but over the years, uh, I think past leadership, um, I, I can't speak personally for it, but uh, you know, has tried to develop a better relationship with the Minnesota Dark House Angling, Asso and Angling um, Association. And they're, they've been a vocal group um, and an advocate for continuing spearing and um, through working with that group, that's how we came up with these different winter regulations. Another thing that was informative was in 2015, there was a survey of Northern Pike anglers and spearers conducted by the University of Minnesota and the responses from that in terms of preferred um, sizes, um, preferred number to keep that sort of stuff really did inform these regulations um, and that document uh, would be available. I'm not sure where we can find it, but it was um, through Sue Schroeder at the University of Minnesota. Um, and uh, I think there are dark house uh, spears who aren't affiliated with one of the, I think it's maybe, it's over a dozen uh, chapters of the Dark House Mangling Association um, in Minnesota, um, who might not, you know, understand as well that that slot fish in the north central zone is not a target, that kind of thing. But I do feel like this group has been a really good advocate for um, both helping our regulations be effective and then also shaping the regulations to um, be better for the sport. So um, we get a lot of questions about that, but uh, and I'm happy to answer any questions that come up to the best of my ability. But long story short, it's you know through uh, work with the, the sport group that we do our best to manage. Um, for different kinds of methods. So we put these zone regulations into you know, the law of the land. They started in 2018. So this will be, um, I think the fourth you know, fishing season, ice fishing season of that kind of a regulation. And um, we do have an evaluation plan in place. Um, we're using the lake survey data that's collected every summer on different lakes by our fisheries management staff. And we're using that standardized data collection to compare the catch of fish before and after um, these regulations went into place. We're specifically looking at different length groups of fish by zone, you know, targeting, we wanted to increase fish over 26 inches, you know, for instance, in our central zone. So how is that going? Um, that kind of thing. Um, because Northern Pike have a longer generation time, they're just a longer lived in general, um, slower growing fish. We kind of knew that it was probably gonna take a little bit of time for populations to respond to these regulations. Um, and we're planning to have uh, a more thorough evaluation summary of the data at the 10 year mark. So in about 2028, um, 
but we have been keeping an eye on the data as it comes in. And um, so far, you know, uh, nothing too surprising. Um, the first few years of data looked a lot like the last few years. Um, this plot here shows the catch, uh, the average catch of northern pike in the north central zone from 22 to 26 inches in our lake surveys over time. And you can see there was uh, a few more of them um, in the 90s and 2000s, and the numbers kind of dropped a little bit um, before we put our zone regs in place. But um, you know, we hope to see that number increase over time. Hasn't really jumped yet, but you know, we'll keep an eye on it to make sure that these zone regulations, which are you know kind of an experiment and definitely a difference from um, what we had for so long, are you know working to um, achieve our goals. So that's kind of the, you know, less fun part of this. And now <laughs> I guess I hope it was, it's fun for me, but I think this is really tip up fishing is something that makes me smile. Um, and I hope that you'll enjoy talking about it too. I personally am not an expert at tip up fishing. I have done it and had a lot of fun as a group. And I think that's one of the best ways to do it is, um, you know, have a group of people who go out and, and just, um, enjoy a day on the ice and, uh, you know, follow the flags as they fly. Um, and you might only need like one or two people who really know how yeah, to, you know, drill the holes or set the lines or whatever, but um, a lot of people can enjoy it because once they're set, um, they're a lot of fun. So that's my disclaimer. I'm not an expert, but I do know the basics. And then we've got um, Jeff and Benji online here who would also love to talk about pike fishing too. So. Um, I'll go through a little bit and then did you just want to jump, jump in as you see, see helpful? Okay. Sure. So, uh, there's lots of different kinds of tip up rigs. I have 1 at home that is like a circle that covers the hole and the ice. I guess the idea to be your hole freezes over less, but yeah, yeah, there you go. Um, and, but they also just look like a piece of a piece of wood or this plastic thing. Um, pretty simple thing where you've got a spool of braided line um, with a leader on the end and a big treble hook that you put a minnow on and um, you just uh, set that through the hole nice and you try and catch a pike and when the flag flies you go get it right Benji. <laughs> That's the hard part is setting all the flags right? Yeah. So yeah. You have a note on the bottom there you're allowed two lines in the winter. I like yeah. to especially if I'm with kids or with other people I like to have an actively fishing line too for uh, just jigging for some perch or or whatnot, and then have a couple flags out too. But yeah, like you said, it's a lot of fun, and people get really excited when flags start going up. So, yeah. In terms of where, uh, this is a really simple lake map of a lake near Duluth that you know it's really only got just it's pretty flat and it's got the one point, and that's probably where you would go where you're looking for. Um, a point or weeds or a drop off, something like that, and um, trying to, you know, maybe even set a couple tip ups at different depths and uh, and see what works best, and um, you know maybe keep the minnow suspended because pike are more likely to be looking up as they uh, target their bait. But you know that's another fun thing about winter fishing, being able to have a couple lines per person is you can try some different stuff. Um, that sounds about right. Yeah, we'll see a lot of people. Like fishing points, um, there's lake right over in the metro area there that it's got a couple of points that run really long out and just drill in holes all the way out there. So you get different depths going out. So you can try to see where those pike, how deep they're swimming and, and where they are. And I like to, and Jeff, you can probably chime in too, is I like to suspend a minnow near the top of the weeds, not a foot or two over the weeds, but kind of right near the top of the weeds is where I seem to have more success, I guess. Yeah, and you know, Brittany, Bethany, you talked at the beginning about how pike really relate to vegetation, and that's not necessarily the case across the whole state where, you know, some of our northern lakes have a lot more rocks and less vegetation. You'll find them in the rocks too, but throughout a lot of the part of the state, vegetation is so key, and especially in the wintertime, and green vegetation because that's giving off oxygen, right? So the water is usually healthier for the fish to be around. There'll be more bait fish. And so looking for that green vegetation is key. And I've had good luck over weed flats. So especially, and again, in our central part of the state, we've got um, water clarity where 
weeds can grow down out of 16, 18 feet of water and they may come up about 10 feet high. So if you can find that flat where you've got um, 10 to 15 feet of water with weeds and then you know a space above the weeds, we'll see a lot of northerns cruising, especially on the outer edge on the weed line, as you mentioned. And so being all along that long flat uh, where there's green vegetation is really key. Cool. Uh, so this is another one of those things that's a little bit tricky where you can have uh, tackle configurations that have multiple hooks. You think about a rapala that might have a treble hook in the front and the back. Um, and what I found was that generally, you know, spending a minnow with just one treble hook will do the trick, but you can, you know, use either a quick strike or a stinger rig. Um, where you have more than one hook, it's just those hooks cannot be more than 9 inches apart. I think is the, the main thing to remember there. Yeah, for those of us that have been fishing in Minnesota for a while, there was some confusion around this for many years. And I don't know if you know which year they actually changed this rule, but there was some belief or it was confusion about whether or not you could even use a treble hook when you're fishing with a tip up. But I think folks have recognized and realized that being able to do that quick strike and set the hook with a treble hook or a uh, strike, uh, shoot, what's the word, the, uh, a stinger hook does help, you know, to be able to set the hook quicker before the fish actually swallows a hook down deep and then it gets a lot harder to to get that hook out of there without damaging the fish so um, i think this was a good change and as long as you're less than nine inches between your hooks you're in good shape um so i think one of the best tips is when the flag flies not to run um, because uh, you know, you're on ice and you may slip and fall, but it, it is funny how exciting it, it can be, um, especially for kids and stuff. So um, you want to make your way towards the flag and then, you know, to grab this line with bare hands, you got to be careful because you don't want to uh, cut your hands as you're pulling it in. But the idea is you're just using hand over hand. There's no um, reel uh, to, to get the, the fish in. Um, I will say, you know, when it comes to setting the hook and all that stuff, I bet you guys have better tips. I usually just go right for it and, you know, you lose some and it's, I've just been out there having fun. <laughs> yeah, I think if you have that treble hook or stinger hook, you can set the hook pretty quickly. You never know. It seems it's really hard to figure out, but the, the, I guess the general wisdom is that, again, let's talk about Northern biology. Um, their mouths, they have all these teeth that a lot of times will come up and smack a, a minnow and hit it like or grab it sideways you know in their mouth and then they'll get to a spot where they're like can take a break and turn it because they're a long you know fish have these long bodies big you know, mouths that they have to fall, usually swallow head first so it's when they stop pause turn it then you're uh, in theory you're able to set the hook um, and have a higher catch rate but again i think it's having those stinger hooks or those treble hooks you know if it's in the middle of fish, the fish grabs it like they're just gonna wrap it and go. If you set the hook right away, nine times out of 10, or maybe not that high, but a good percentage of time, you're gonna have success. Does that jive with your thoughts, Benji, and some of your experiences? Yeah, you, you know, I've, I think we've all lost fish trying to set the hook too early too, but yeah, it, it is interesting how they'll, they'll swim really fast and then there'll be this pause where, where they're trying to reorientate the fish so they can swallow it. And that's, you know, if you can time that and, and get to the flag and feel that pause in there, that's the perfect time to do it. It doesn't always work out, of course, but you know, I've had kids just run out and just grab the line and just start pulling it really fast, too, and that works. I think it is key, just like it is in open water, though, you've got to set the hook. I mean, that first pull, that first tug has got to be really sharp because you want to drive that hook in. Um, if you just do a gradual, you know, the fish may just be holding on to the northern park in particular, hold, just hold on because they have all these teeth, actually. They, it fish, the bait will stay in their mouth for a long time, and then finally they get a little bit of a break or a, a gap or the line, you know, a little bit of slack, and then they can just let go. So it is important to get a good hook set. Yeah, and then just uh, the thing I have the most experience with is getting uh, bit by pike. Um, so you do want to make sure you stay away from those teeth and use the pliers or something to get the the hook out um, because they're they're toothy and, and a little bit uh, dangerous. 
Speaking of that, do you have do you have some good tips, Bethany, on just how to hold a fish and how to pick it up and the northern? How, how what's a good good suggestions on that? Well, that's where it's funny. I mean, I would prefer to use a glove to hold it because they are so slippery. Um, but if you have bare hands to pull on the line, yeah, I'm not really. That's also where it's nice to have more than one person around so you can kind of tag team it. It's a little easier um, on the ice and in the boat and kind of walk around each other. But Angie, you thought? It, don't grab it by its mouth. Yeah. So use the gill, grab it underneath, support the full yeah. fish. Yep. Um, Do not lift them. Um, yeah, northerns are, um, especially the big northerns, um, maybe Bethany, you've done some research on this, but there's, you know, people used to hold them up um, vertically and there's a lot of concern, I think, that's developed over time that shows that's hard on their vertebrae and, and just all that weight hanging. So it's much better to hold them horizontally, right? Yeah, that is true. Yep. Yeah. If you're intending, especially to release a fish or, you know, you need to measure it if you're angling um, before you do anything. So you want to keep the fish healthy if you can um, up until that point where you know what you're going to do next. We had a question in the Q&A there, Adam put in there, he likes to use 18 pound mason line because it's easier on his hands. But on the bottom of my uh, tip up here, I got, I just use a, I think it's called Dacron line. It's like a 60 pound test and it just winds up in this little spool. But, and I have that attached to my leader as I stick a hook into my pant jeans down there. But, and that runs down to a big treble hook. I don't know if you can see that, but it's, um, is that a, that's what I've used. I've never used Mason's line, but that might be a, if, especially if you're a Mason, that might be a good option. So I, um, I attended last January the um, Dark House Spear uh, presentation, and she had a really great list of equipment to bring. And so I tried to compile some stuff that's, you know, the essentials and the nice to have. Um, first, you need an auger or a friend with an auger. Um, I have a hand auger, and I, you know, again, with the kind of community aspect of tip up fishing. Um, usually someone will come and take pity on me though. So, you know, even if you just want to sort of act like, oh, it's so hard, you know, maybe be kind of loud. Someone will come, uh, drill it out maybe for you. Otherwise it's not so bad. Um, it's a great way to stay warm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, you want to be able to scoop your ice out. So they've got those little metal scoops that haven't changed for a hundred years, I suppose. Um, something to sit on warm clothes in that safety plan. Um, you really can't emphasize that enough, you know, um, we'll talk about it a little more in detail, but the, uh, the DNR has a great um, section on the website about um, things to do to stay safe on the ice, what to do if you go in, what to do if someone else goes in, and just having that all kind of fresh in your mind, um, just in case, because you never know when that one time is going to be that you need that information. Um, Having a lake map so you can find those different drop offs or whatever. Um, lake Finder's got a map for every lake pretty much, or there's lots of apps and stuff. Something to remove the hook to keep your fingers away. And then um, I think just key uh, is, yeah, anytime you go out fishing, if you think you're going to catch a pike, remember that you're going to need to measure that fish. So you have to have a way to do that. Um, there is no more, you know, catch. Um, Catch and it's probably okay of pike. There's, you know, the lake regulations are pretty specific, so you want to make sure you have a way to stay legal. And that's great if you have to pull it along and all that. Yeah. I just think one of the great things about fishing for northern pike in the winter time, especially, is you don't need a lot of equipment, and you can get out there and access areas that you, if you don't have a boat, that you, you know you can now access in the winter that you couldn't before. So it's a, it's a really good way to start and get a, tip, a couple of tip ups and in some uh, Sacramento's, which aren't cheap anymore. But yeah, you know, if you get a, a few Sacramento's, you, you can have some good action. It's a lot of fun. And the Lake Finder map and the Red Compass is also another great reference for that. I know there's probably 50 apps and there's other, other stuff that you can use to find areas in the lakes where you'd like to target. But the Lake Finder map and the Red Compass are right on the DNR website and they're they're pretty good. So. Uh, Adam asked about preferred bait and type of minnows. We've been mentioning minnows. Um, I just said sucker minnows, which to me is the best choice just because they seem to be more hardy. Shiner minnows certainly are very effective can, and can work really well. Um, but again, 
no northerns are pretty can be big so you do want a pretty good size sucker um but you know depending on the lake you're fishing you might want to increase that if you know there's a lot of big fish in the lake but um that's that was my preferred bait but benji you mentioned uh, a rod and reel with a jig on it or some other sort of flashy um uh, winter type jigs are uh, for through, fishing through the ice. If you go to your local bait store and say, I want a, a ice fishing jig, they can sell, get you set up with that or a small spoon work really well too. And sometimes Northerns or fish in general prefer a really slow um, presentation or just a, a minnow sitting there under the tip up, but sometimes they like a lot of action. So having that extra rod with a jig on it or a little plug, uh, a little spoon can you know, get some fish really excited and get them, get a good reaction strike and you might have better success with that. So it all a lot of times just comes down to practicing, experimenting, trying, find out what works. And then if it's something works, you know, keep repeating it. So. And, and ask your bait shop. They got, you know, some guys will have, some bait shops have like nine inch minnows that they use, you know, maybe it's a chub or, or whatever kind of minnow they got, but that's what, they recommend for the lakes in their area and we might use something different here versus up north so go into your local bake shop and say hey i'm going to go dip up fishing for some northerns you know what kind of what do you recommend and they'll probably point you in the right direction so and then just back to that ice safety um this is from our website where um you know, uh, and it also on the, the site has instructions for how you check the depth of the ice, um, which, you know, I personally am one of those people who's probably going to wait till there's a lot of other people out there on the ice, but we have people um, up here by Duluth. There's a couple of lakes that are already iced over and they're um, out, out on them. So um, remember, ice is never safe, um, but it can be fun when you take precautions. And kind of with that, um, I think our DNR climatology website is really cool. Um, often we're keeping a close eye on the ice out um, information that's available there, but they also have ice in um, average dates for a lot of lakes throughout the state. So if you're wondering, well, gee, when, when about is that lake near me gonna ice over? Um, this will tell you on average when that happens. Of course, it varies from year to year. And unlike the ice out data, they don't keep this up to date um, as the data is coming in just for safety reasons, because what, you know, ice in on a lake is can vary. Is it just when, you know, it's totally covered? Is it when most of it's covered? Is it when it's four inches deep? You know, um, so it's not, you know, um, going to tell you if you can go out today, but it is kind of a, a fun and helpful resource um, that you can find again through the DNR. And then just finally, um, I want to say thank you um, and thank you to the people who took me along tip up fishing. Um, and uh, thank you to anyone who's out there considering maybe taking it personal along, helping them find out if they need a license or what to wear and all that kind of stuff. Because um, maybe some people have never done it and they, it seems like a totally foreign concept, but once you're out there, it's a lot of fun. Um, this is a picture from a restaurant that uh, it's not, it was redecorated, but um, just a reminder that most pike do only have one head. This is a hoax mount, and there's also a picture that circulates um, once in a while of a pike with two heads on a stringer. Um, and they're fun to think about and fun to think about how voracious northern pike are. But I promise you, they're not as scary as um, we'd like to believe. And that's the end of my slides. Thanks, Thanks so much. We do have a question. We do have a question that's related. Um, Someone had asked uh, Bill if there are different subspecies of northern pike, and they're getting at I think some of the um, potentially fish being less, um, you know, not being able to keep them because they're not ever getting big enough to get into that slot limit. And so he's asking, are, are, have we seen that where there might be different growth rates and things like that across the state? Um, Lauren Miller, who is our geneticist for the DNR, he did look at uh, pike. It's you know, already been um, a couple decades, maybe, and the genetic technology has changed a lot. But there wasn't a lot of variation in the northern pike stocks throughout the state like there are with walleye. That's not to say with our newer technology and more specific methods that we couldn't start teasing apart those differences now. Generally, we think that the differences in growth are really related to the lake itself. There's some cool things, though, about pike. There's a silver phase 
that's more common up in uh, the northern part of the state by Grand Rapids, which is just a, a lighter color pike, um, you know, kind of special to catch. But um, that's about what I know. Okay. I'm going to ask you, and since you you are the researcher, uh, some other uh, another question related. I know the DNR has been working on some diet studies. Do you want to share some information about what we're finding with what northern pike are eating? Because I think that's really can be applied to our fishing techniques. Yes, um, and that again is work that's being done by DNR research in collaboration with partners, but Brian Herwig in Bemidji and Tyler Ehringsdorf and uh, Brainerd um, are looking at what pike, muskie, bass, and walleyes are eating in a few different lakes. Um, and the pike story is pretty simple. It's a lot of perch in a lot of cases. So, um, you know, I guess that's more uh, relevant for when you're targeting them in the summer and using some of those things that are replicating perch, but that should be effective. Um, yeah, perch are still an important part of our food webs. Yeah, I was surprised. Surprise! I mean, amazed at how it's, it's perch are significantly uh, a big part in some lakes, and so uh, clearly, it's to me at the the message as an angler is that you, know, you really want to use some of that perk perch imitating uh, lures, crankbaits, and things that you know act. And where you find perch is where you're going to find pike. So that's really good information. We are hoping to line up actually those researchers come and talk to us uh, later uh, next spring. And, and specific, specifically related to musky fishing, but to give us some details because they're finding really, really interesting stuff on that that study. So it's great information. And, and Jeff, as a spear fisherman, do you use a musky decoy, or a, not a musky decoy, a perch decoy when you're spear fishing? Uh, I have I have not because I have uh, been using a, a, a one that's a sucker imitation, but white a very a lot of lakes I fish in central Minnesota. There's a lot of ciscos and, and, and light colored fish too, so that is a big part of their diet. And but it's got a little bit of red red on it too, which seems to really trigger you know the, the classic daredevil right white and red uh, <laughs> does always seem to trigger trigger northerns. But uh, yeah, I in fact my decoy gets smashed all the time. I can't get a chance to actually spear the fish because they come in so quickly <laughs> and so hot. <laughs> grabbing the grabbing the, the the decoy, I don't even get a chance to throw the spear. But uh, yeah. Um, there are a lot of uh, different decoys that are fun to use and can be really effective in smearing. So it's, it's a fun sport. I'm just saying, I don't think I have any decoys that are real perch looking, but I, sh I might have to look for one, paint one up mm -hmm. this year. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we had a question Mark asked in Bethany, I think you referenced, referenced it earlier about the netting results. Is there a website that we can put in the chat that people could go and look at, or is that kind of, spaced out by area office? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, because these are kind of, you know, unofficial results, we're just watching it, you know, knowing that it's probably going to take longer. We haven't formed an official report yet for the public. Um, that's a, that being said, if you do contact your local area office or me, I we do have, you know, a memo written up about it and um, are happy to talk about it in an unofficial capacity as we wait for the final results. Okay, great. Yes, yeah, check your area office. I think that's probably the best bet. So, or reach out to Bethany. So, I think it was in the chat. Someone posted a link for some great um, pike handle holder, you know, like teeth spreaders. And I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about that, Bethany, but certainly their teeth are really dangerous and there's so many in their mouth that there are some really good tools to, to grippers that to can grip their jaw. And or to spread the teeth so that you can get the hooks out and stuff. So your local bait store, uh, sporting goods store, again, will have a lot of those resources. But that's a really good tip. Yeah, I would. I mean, I think I am out on lake surveys a lot where we catch pike, um, and that's where I encounter a lot of them. And you're trying to measure them, and I've um, made the mistake of with other fish, you maybe can hold them, you know, under the lip a little bit, and you cannot do that with pike because their teeth will go right through that skin. So. Um, even if you're thinking, well, I'm not going in the mouth, I'm those teeth are everywhere. Uh, yeah, I definitely would endorse any item that helps you with that. And and even coming underneath, you know, bigger fish I've got, you can you can reach under that gill the edge of their bottom of the gill, but they have these gill rakers in there that are super sharp too. 
really fun story. My daughter caught a 36 and a half inch northern and she was holding it up for a photo. And um, she actually had it on a stringer and it just flared and shook and actually raked her. <laughs> she had blood coming down the side of her forearm because it had gotten her with its gill raker. So yeah, you, you gotta be careful with them, but it's a fun story. Uh, one of the things, go ahead, Benji. I was going to say, I see another one in here for you. Uh, John was asking if using a floral leader, what line weight do you recommend to prevent, help prevent bite offs? Well, um, when I'm fishing in the summer, actually, where I know that we have northerns, I will use a steel leader or some sort of other metal leader. Um, in, in the wintertime, um, I, I have not used the leaders. I just use the really thick Dacron line that I've got. Um, so again, you kind of need to experiment, but I, I've gotten bitten off too many times <laughs> with some of the really, you know, uh, fluorocarbon or monofilament lines. So good, good question. And I know some of the, some people use like a 20 or 30 pollen test floral and they've have mm -hmm. some luck in it, but yeah, like you said, I think any floral line is without a steel leader, you're going to get bit off at some point. You have better better success with a heavier line, but yeah, their teeth are sharp. It. It's trying to find that balance because obviously sometimes the the fish can see those lines and they're going to avoid your your line too. So it's it's a give and take. Um, hard hard to know to be honest with you. John put in there too, and I don't know if you've ever heard of this. I haven't, but has D the DNR looked into getting any ice spy devices? I know they're wireless. I just Googled them. They're wireless temperature monitors, but I've never heard of them before. So I've never, never used one, but. What we do have is um, temp, temp logger chains that monitor the, 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 some cases, the oxygen and the temperature at different depths that um, are in several of our lakes throughout the year, actually. Um, they'll be retrieved or changed out in the winter. Um, but yeah, you might see a buoy sunk under the water. And um, if you do, don't try and pull it up or anything. That could be something that's helping us monitor the temperature of the lakes. Now that wouldn't have like that live data, you know, where you could see when the ice is um, coming on. But yeah, we, I mean, temperature monitoring has only become a more important part of what we do. And I think for ice too, you, you know, temperature monitoring doesn't necessarily mean it's safe. It's still, you got to be smart about it and be cautious out there. And we had a good example of this, not, I guess not a good example, but this past weekend when 200 anglers were stranded on Red Lake, when a big sheet of ice drifted off, broke off and floated out. So, you know, make a plan and make sure you tell people where you're going and make sure you're taking care of yourself out there. So. You know, I have another another question for you, Bethany. Um, we you have used actually in this talk different terms to describe northern pike or or names of the fish northern northern pike. And then we saw pickerel on the old regulations. What is the story? What's the real name? Or is there you know is it everything okay? What what do you say? Yeah, that's funny. Um, and in the old old reg books, or even some of our old surveys. Um, walleye will be called walleye pike or whatever. So it can get really confusing when you go back to historical records. Um, yeah, I don't know what's, you know, technically correct. It's Esoc Lucius if you want to be scientific, <laughs> but yeah, pike or northern. That's why we have scientific names for fish and other or animals, right? <laughs> Ron, we generally, we, we generally use northern pike, it seems like those kind of the standard northern or northern pike is kind of the standard term now, that common name. So Ron had a question there, and Ron, I'd like to know what lake you're talking about, I guess, but does the DNR have any plans to address lakes with pike overabundance that cannot be corrected by angler harvest? So Yeah, that's and that's a story in more lakes than we like. Um, and that's where our plan to try and grow big pike in those lakes is um, the, you know, our best strategy. There have been studies that removed pike, um, but where you have wetlands or vegetation for them to spawn on in the spring, you're always going to have 
we call it recruitment or year classes of that fish that replace more than you could ever take out. Um, so it, the hope is to rebalance the populations really um, and to restore large predators to the systems where we can. Great. And then uh, we gotta... I think that the big the big takeaway is just release those big big pike, right? So they can continue to swim and harvest and eat those smaller pike. That's going to be the most effective way to get those populations back under control. And we had a question from Christine in the chat. That she was at Joe's Sporting Goods, and they told her flags were illegal. I don't know where that came from. I've never heard that, but. Um, you know, having too many of them, I suppose, if you're out there fishing with a rod and reel and four tip ups might be illegal by yourself, but I've, I've never came across that and it is a legal sport in Minnesota. So. I think there's some confusion around the distance that you can be away from your tip ups and I, I don't have the rules open to that page, but is it 50 yards or something like that? Um, you do have to be in the manageable distance so that you can get over and get that fish uh, hooked before they do swallow the hook and things like that. So there is a restriction on how far away you can be from the tip ups. And there are rules about, um, like bells and things. I mean, with the same idea in mind that you don't want to have unattended tackle. Uh, maybe that's where some of the confusion came in, but tip ups are definitely legal. Yeah, I, I believe there was, you know, is it 200 feet that you have to be within? So. If you have to be within 200 feet of your tip up, so you can't run a long line or you can't go sit in your shack and not be watching them. So, um, I think, I think we got through most of the questions. So, oh, I just got that one. Um, are pikes stocked by the DNR in any lakes? It's a great question. And it used to be a much more common practice, especially in the southern part of the state. Um, and there would be uh, wetland rescues were places where it'd go anoxic in the uh, winter or something, and they uh, try and save the pike and put them elsewhere. Uh, Waterville has a hatchery, and they are actually the only hatchery that still raises northern pike fry in the state, um, and they do a little bit of stocking in that area. And then there is still a northern pike winter rescue operated out of the Aiken area, um, where they then uh, find fish that would otherwise die and then stock them into another place. But it's pretty uncommon now. Great. And John just put a question there. He said, jaw jackers, those might be what she's referring to that automatically yank and set on the hooks that might be illegal. So that could be what they're referencing back to Christine's question in the flags. So. Um, I think that's about it. So I was going to touch just real quick on the technical work groups, Bethany, that you're working with. How does the public interact with those? I know some of our work groups invite public input and comment and sometimes public people out there that aren't fisheries researchers, but just avid fishermen are on part of those committees. Can, do you want to address that real quick? Yeah, we have um, an Assassin work group that uh, advises both the Muskie technical team and the Northern Pike technical team. Um, and we actually just got some new membership on there um, in the same effort that went out to get, you know, deer input. I think there's some different work groups that wanted new membership and I know it's hard unless you're plugged into the right channels to find out when um, those happen. Uh, those efforts to get new membership happen, but um, we are, look, you know, always looking for active stakeholder inputs and um, whether you're actually on the work group or want to talk with people on the work group. I think that's um, a great idea. Uh, and the best way to get a hold of those folks is probably again to reach out to your area office or to you know me I could connect to you um, because it's uh, all about you know getting to the right person in the DNR who then could connect you with the work. Yep. So I just want to yeah make a point that there's if you want to be involved no matter what your um, passion is if it's if it's walleye or if it's deer hunting or or musky fishing or Northern Pike fishing, there is work groups out there. If you desire to be involved in that, we're always looking for, for people to join and, and give us input. So I think with that, I noticed we were out of time though, Bethany. So thank you very much for, for joining, joining us today. It was a great talk on 
on some of the history and the research with muskies or with northern pike, excuse me, and uh, they really can affect and help our success rate when we're out there fishing. So thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Yep, thanks, everyone. Hopefully we'll see you next week. Yeah, see you out on the ice.